so here we go all right so good morning everyone um i see we still have some people joining us but we are going to get slowly started um, so happy to be here with you all today uh, my name is sarah chettleborough i'm just going to share my video and wave hello so you can see who's speaking um, and uh, I am joined by Gemma Fraser. And Gemma, would you like to, to do the same? Sure. I'm just uh, getting my video up there. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. So we are um, counselors and student services, um, as well as some learning strategy work. And we are just so grateful to have this chance to connect with you this morning and talk about uh, a really important area, supporting our students' mental health. Um, and just before we got started today, we were talking about how it's been a really challenging year for many of us. And we've had an interesting, it's kind of been unique in that we've been balancing the mental health of our students while also looking after our own mental health and that of our families. So. Just an extra acknowledgement that thank you for taking the time to be here today. And we know that uh, Royal Roads is actually doing a really good job, I think, of supporting student mental health. We hear often from students how pleasantly surprised they are by the um, uh, support they receive, the flexibility they've been offered this year through COVID, and uh, just the, the strong level of interaction that they get from our staff and faculty. So I think just a reminder, this is not a session because we are not doing this well, but this is a chance to connect and uh, just remind ourselves what are our strategies, what supports are available to students, what's going on with student mental health at Royal Roads. Um, so thank you again for, for being here. So before we get any further, of course, just like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional lands of the Kwisepsum and Lekwungen families um, that you know Royal Roads lies on and connects us all. So although we may be joining from, I think, all over the island, perhaps beyond today, um, internationally as well, I uh, just encourage you all to take a moment to acknowledge wherever it is you're joining us from today and the families that have lived there for many years. Um, I'm just about 15 minutes away from campus um, on the lands of the Chiana families and ancestors and so grateful to, to be in such a beautiful place. Um, just been here for a year in our, our new home and uh, something I was enjoying this morning, I opened the window and I could hear the seals' tails flapping from down in the bay near Woody's Lagoon. And that's something that I remember from last fall. And then they kind of disappeared in the spring and summer. And now the seals are back flapping away, enjoying, um, I think, the, the sandbars and shallows of, off Woody's Lagoon. So uh, beautiful sound and so appreciative to have the opportunity to live here. So our plan today, um, we're going to just briefly review our Royal Road student mental health framework, um, talk a little bit about the state of student mental health um, at Royal Roads at the moment. I'm uh, gonna review some signs and symptoms of mental health concerns to look out for. We will talk about some strategies for how to support students that you may be concerned about. Um, and how and when to refer to both counselors like Gemma and myself, as well as the care team. And then, like I mentioned, we will stop the recording after that point and have a more open opportunity to chat, to discuss, to ask some questions. Um, and that is optional if you'd like to stay, uh, understanding that many of you probably have other things you might need to get to as well, and that is totally okay. And at any point, you know, we want this to be comfortable, informal, interactive, so uh, please do feel free to ask questions, share comments, share observations in the chat box, or jump on the microphone at any point. Right, so um, imagine many of you are, oh, and thank you, Gwen. Yes, no student names, please, um, throughout the discussion so that um, we are keeping that confidential and respecting the privacy of our students. So we will talk gen more generally throughout the conversation. And Jason, yes, I think we can share the slides. As far as I know, that shouldn't be a problem and the recording will be available as well. So um, many of you might be familiar with Royal Road's student mental health framework. Uh, it was developed by a 
working group, I think about two years ago now, two to three years ago, um, and formally announced in 2019, I believe. And um, a great team of people came together and really, you know, identified that there was a need to provide a framework to guide us in supporting student mental health. And so you hear here on this slide, what we aim for at Royal Roads is a state in which every student can successfully navigate the normal stresses of being a student, can realize their own academic potential, can work productively towards fulfilling their own human potential, and achieve their life-changing educational goals. So really nice, I think, grounding description of what it is we do in regards to um, supporting mental health at Royal Roads. And four elements are identified in our framework, and those are plan for healthy learning, develop a culture of care, deliver effective support services, and create a state of awareness and responsiveness. And so that's really where we're focusing on today, but I think you know, we're really touching on all four elements. So if anyone um, is curious, if this is new to you and you'd like to read the full report, I'm just going to paste the link in the chat box and feel free, you know, perhaps after the session to have a look at that. Um, and we're always open to, I think, feedback and um, conversation around it because I imagine it, it will be something that we will revisit from time to time. All right. So, um, there's no comments or questions so far. Uh, we just wanted to, to pause here for a minute and uh, think a little bit about what type of concerning situations do you face in your role with students? So we have a little poll here, but we're not actually using the poll feature um, because we often find it's a little bit more fun to ask you to, to click on the pencil on the top left of your screen and circle. Um, or maybe you'd like to take the text, the little T button, and add something that we haven't listed here. So if you'd like, just select, you know, what are maybe the one or two most common situations you face with your students? <laughs> I think someone's <laughs> gone for all of them. Yeah, a few people. Cool. Awesome, yeah. So a lot of people, students uh, are feeling frustrated with their program or academic expectations. That's a, that's a really common one. Uh, highly anxious or stressed. Yeah, and I think um, April, I think I saw someone raise their hand. Was that April? I clicked on that accidentally. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> well, please do anyone jump in at any point. Okay, so I see several of you have circled all of these and these are certainly very common um, student situations, a lot dealing with the frustration or students telling you about a heavy situation, a lot of highly stressed students. It looks like C, E, and F are our top ones. And then you've added in a few extra family health and being away from them. Yeah, that's really been a huge one this year, hasn't it? And stress over the IRCC, so immigration rules. Yeah, for some of your programs who have a lot of international students, I know that's a really big stressor for them. Um, being away from family for the first time. Yeah, huge, all this newness, right, and learning and um, a lot of anxiety. So, yeah, thank you. So we're going to talk through, you know, what some of these situations are like for our students and look at some strategies for supporting them. Oh, and I see a couple people have added finances. Yeah, of course, we, mm -hmm. we likely should have listed that as a huge one, of course, the financial yeah. piece. So, yeah. yeah. Did Gemma, anything to add to that? Do you know, sir, I was just thinking um, the the you know chicken and egg chicken and the egg kind of situation too with some of this stuff is more seeing students who are frustrated with their program or academic expectations, and at the same time we're seeing um, highly anxious or stressed students, and so sometimes those feed into each other, and uh, or you know one might one might sort of cause the other. So it's it's mm -hmm. just sometimes you feel like hard to know which thread to pull on as we're supporting um, our students. So it's just really great to just acknowledge that sometimes we don't really know um, what's coming underneath, but we just see we see what they present. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. It's so, so true. And it's often complex and it isn't just one, right? And I think, oh, Ken, I see you've mentioned that students with PTSD, uh, military conflict situations, 
of course, that's that's already a lot to be bringing into a program. And then we tack on stress and uh, financial strain, uh, COVID, uh, and it's it's a lot. It's been a pretty heavy year for a lot of students, and we want to acknowledge they are often coming with their own experiences or mental illness, um, some mental health challenges and their own family stressors. So um, thank you for all participating in this. It's really you know, helpful to see what it is you are hearing from students and acknowledging that we are hearing a lot, I think, from students mm -hmm. and especially this year. So I am gonna pass over to Gemma at this point. Great, thank you, Sarah. So um, Sarah and I thought it might be um, helpful or interesting to share just a little bit about what we see sort of on the counselling and learning strategy front when um, students come and book one-on-one -on -one sessions with us. And we, um, you know, obviously we're only seeing a small subsection of the students at the university, but I think it probably gives us a little bit of a, a highlight as to the um, the more common things that students are experiencing as they go through their studies. And I'm just going to close my blind a minute. I'm being blinded by this beautiful sun that is coming through. I'm so sorry. Beautiful Darn sun time. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's like one moment where I love the sun, but I need to block it out so I can see the screen. Um, and as you see, this probably won't be any surprise that stress, um, stress and anxiety tend to be the most common thing that students shop and want to uh, work on um, or share during counselling um, sessions. Um, at the top of the screen, you'll also notice that we've been tracking for a few years now the, the sort of number of sessions and um, the type of um, issues that students are bringing. In uh, last year, 2019, we were seeing on average about 65, running about 65 sessions a month um, as a little um, team. And this year in 2020, we've averaged uh, 98 students per month. And for those of you who, those of you who are a little uh, math nerdy, that's about a 40% 40, 40 increase in the number of sessions that we've delivered. Not very surprising given the type of year we've been having, but um, yeah, it's just been interesting, a really interesting year. I think the, the um, one of the things that is, is interesting is not necessarily that the type of things that have changed, but just the intensity of what students are bringing, um, and perhaps the number of students obviously that are coming to see us is is, um, is higher. So stress, anxiety remain the top things. Um, relationship issues are really at the heart of many of the sessions that we work through um, with students, um, and depression is in there, and that often is linked to feelings of anxiety as well. Um, on the learning skills side as well, um, you know, we, we know that a lot of students um, struggle with school and if they struggle with school, then they're more likely to have anxiety or experience stress. And likewise, if students are experiencing stress and anxiety, then their learning um, and study habits may, um, may suffer. So it's kind of hand in hand together. Um, and we continue to see that uh, major projects create some distress for students, particularly if they fall behind their cohort. Um, it can feel very lonely, very isolating for students, and that is sometimes a, a, a sort of a time when they open up the door, come knocking on our door to come and chat with us about how they might uh, get through that. Sarah, did you have anything else that you wanted to say about these stats before we move forward? No, I, I think they speak for themselves pretty well, and you've done a nice job summarizing what our experiences have been this year. Thanks, Gemma. Great, thanks. Um, so from this, we wanted to share a little bit about some of the things that we've learned. And as Sarah said right at the beginning, um, you know, we so appreciate the care and the compassion that is shown by um, so many people across campus. We know we can't do all the caring work ourselves because it's just, you know, a small little team. So we really do rely upon everybody on the campus to show care and compassion to our students um, you know as as much as they can um, but as we share these things these are some things we've learned and from these learnings maybe some things that um, we can highlight to help you think and reflect on um, how you might be able to play a part in helping to reduce some of the stress for our students so um, the first point there of course is stress and anxiety are the main struggle for our um, students so um, wherever you are on campus, whatever your role is in the way that you interact with students, um, perhaps it can be a, a moment to reflect on, okay, is there anything in the way that your unit 
is interacting with students that maybe is increasing the stress unnecessarily. And obviously there is a, an element of stress that goes with being in school. So I'm not saying we need to eradicate stress. It can be a really helpful um, thing. But is there anything that's increasing the stress unnecessarily? Is there any way that you can maybe tweak things to sort of um, bring that down a little bit? Maybe there's not, maybe you've already done that, but just take a moment to reflect, it can be helpful as a unit. We also know that students are not just students. Um, our students come with a whole life behind them or around them, and that includes things like grief, it includes things like transitions, and all of those will impact the way that they show up um, in the, you know, on the learning field. Um, and the more we can acknowledge that and sort of normalize that for students, I think the, the less stress um, that can have. Sometimes um, students really just need a little bit of compassion. They might need a little bit of extra time to um, complete assignments. So we just ask that if possible, um, if you're in that position to grant that to them on compassionate grounds, then please go ahead and do that. Feel Feel free to do that if you can. I will talk to your program head about that if you're not sure about what your boundaries are around that. Um, and certainly if you feel that more longer term um, supports are needed for students when they're going through major um, transitions or grief, then um, some counselling might be a really good way to help them get the supports they need. I mentioned major projects before. Um, again, if you're a supervisor for um, any students doing a thesis or a major project, just know that if you've got folks who are falling behind, a little thing that can make a big difference is just reaching out and checking in with them and seeing how they're doing. Um, I hear a lot from students, they feel really lonely and they get disenfranchised. And that can be so powerful, just having someone reach out and let them know. Um, and then, uh, of course, counselling helps students be a better student, which we were sort of really happy and pleased to see that um, in our report, in our um, questionnaire that we send out every year. So we put that up there, not really to toot our own horn, but just to really remind you that we are here on campus and we, you know, we love our work that we do. And if you see a student who's struggling, perhaps that can be um, a reminder that uh, you know, an introduction to us um, could go a long way for some students. And Jason, um, thank you for your question around grief as a response to COVID. We certainly saw a lot of that in the early stages of our um, of our work in the new COVID environment. Um, and actually, we um, did do a uh, workshop for a bunch of students to ex to explore this idea of grief around COVID. I think I think at the moment we're not hearing as much of that around. Um, in the sessions that we're dealing with with students, I think it is still there is sort of an undercurrent really that hasn't gone away and perhaps won't go away for you know some time yet. So for those of you who've been um, with us for a while, you probably have an idea of some of the supports that um, exist. But uh, for those of you who may not um, know, because anything shift and change um, sometimes, Sarah and I. Um, as the counselling and learning strategy team um, with our wonderful um, practicum student, Francis, who's been with us since May. We make up the counselling and learning strategist team, but we are part of a broader team that's called the student success team. Um, and the student success team is made up of us and uh, Milena and Alexandra in accessibility services and Michael and Milena, who wears two hats, and financial aid and awards. And we are sort of um, supported uh, by this wonderful safety net called the care team, which is there for students who are in um, sort of true crisis or needing just an extra layer of support and care where you can triangulate some information. So we all really are, um, our mandate is to sort of remove barriers to success for students. Um, and we feel really um, excited and thankful that we have this team that can um, look at some of the challenges, some of the barriers to success from many different avenues and together look towards supporting students. And I know I for one feel really thankful to be able to work with this amazing team which is led by uh, Gwen Camden as our manager and uh, it's, it's a good team. So very thankful, plug for our team. So when it comes to mental health, it's an interesting thing when we start to think about. We all have mental health and at different times we may be mentally um, really quite well and at other times we might be struggling and feeling not so well and at other times um, on a spectrum people might have mental illness. But 
for the purposes of today, uh, Sarah and I really want to talk about this sort of this piece of the spectrum that we might be seeing with students, where we're talking about students in you know under stress, and there's healthy stress where we're feeling a little bit of more sort of an energized. Um, feeling which might help us to motivate and get things done and accomplish our assignments on time, study for exams, things like that. But then there's a stress that becomes um, kind of less healthy and uh, a little bit um, overwhelming and, uh, and sort of impacts our ability to do as well as we would or show up as, as uh, effectively as we normally would. And then we move up the scale of the spectrum, uh, the spectrum here, and we see that we might have students who might be in distress, and it might be um, feelings of a deeper depression or hopelessness. They might uh, sort of disappear, or we might see some of the angry outbursts that uh, um, come with that feeling of that fight or flight kind of um, feeling that comes up when we're under distress or duress. And then we move up further up the spectrum and we could think about uh, students who might be in crisis. And here we would start to be worried about sort of aggressive or violent behaviour, maybe really disoriented behaviour that just doesn't make sense or language that just doesn't make sense. Um, we might be worried about suicide, um, ideation um, or some sort of real medical emergency. And those are the things that uh, we hope we see um, you know, a smaller number of crises in our students. And I feel that, uh, well, I know that when we sort of pay attention and notice the stress when it's at, when it's early as stress stages, we can often avert things getting to the crisis stage um, before it moves through these other stages and gets into a true crisis for a student. So as we say that, what we try to do is we try to encourage people to um, start to attune to some of the signs and symptoms that might be present, that might be an indicator that there's, um, you know, some stress going in that um, maybe we need to start to sort of put some more care, some supports and interventions in place for students. I'm going to take just a moment just to stop talking and let you have a, a, quite of a, a sort of a scan through of this um, slide. Just have a bit of a look through and just pay attention to some of the things that perhaps you've seen in your work with students. Do some of these show up? Do you notice, have you noticed some of these over the months or weeks or years? Sarah and I were curious, so I'm wondering if you uh, feel open to it, maybe picking up a pencil again and maybe just putting a little check mark behind some of the things that you may have noticed in some of your students at some point uh, in your time that we might start to say, okay, here are some of the signs and symptoms that Royal Road students might start to show us and we might, start, might be able to start to attune to. Great, so some of the psychological things. Oh, some dis so disclosure of personal stuff. Wow, okay. Seems to come up a lot. Absences, requests for extensions. Okay, team conflicts and challenges. Panic, teariness. Oh, okay. So people just disappearing. Fatigue, focusing, difficulty focusing. Apathy, hopelessness, irritability. Okay, absence from team meetings. See that as a really um, interesting one where it's, we get this sort of um, insight into what's happening, perhaps through indicators from other team members who bring that to our attention. Right. Screen starts to look pretty messy, doesn't it? a lot of things, a lot of things that our students can sometimes show us to let us know how they're doing. And sometimes as um, staff and faculty, I imagine this can feel overwhelming. As Sarah mentioned earlier, like we are all, all of us just trying to do the best we can in our job from day to day. And then sometimes to see and notice that maybe someone else is struggling. We have to check in and see if we have anything left in our own 
uh, and our own resources and how might we be able to draw on that to help our students. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, self-care for ourselves too later on. So, great. Thank you. And I'm going to hand over to Sarah um, now, I think. Sarah, are you? Mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm still here. Yeah. Thank you all for, <laughs> for uh, just participating in that. It, it just reminded me, I think we're so much in this world every day. And of course, you are too, just, um, you know, hearing so much. I see how many of you selected the disclosures of personal distress. And um, I think it says a lot about the community of support and the trust that students have that they're um, comfortable to share with staff and faculty the way they do. So um, yeah, well done. All right. So we um, so we've now talked, you know, a lot about what we're seeing and um, the types of signs and symptoms and what a student in distress might look like. And so we're going to shift to start to talk about how how do we respond to these students. Um, and so a model that we have been using now for a few years to uh, help kind of feel confident in supporting students is this alert model. And so I think some of you have have joined a session like this in the past. We have been offering them for a few years now and might be familiar with it. And maybe for some of you, this is new. Um, so essentially, the alert model acronyms um, to, to try and help us in a, in a moment where maybe we're feeling a little bit overwhelmed or even a bit triggered ourselves to take a deep breath and and think about how we can support the student. How can we attend to the student in the moment? And so uh, as we think about that huge list we just reviewed of the signs and symptoms of distress, one of the first things we often want to do is acknowledge the, um, you know, what we're observing, perhaps the change in behavior. And when we do that, we want to be pretty specific and we want to be direct um, so that we can as quickly as possible uh, show that we are, are there for the student and addressing the issue. And so something that I find very helpful is a comment like, I've noticed X. So I've noticed that you, you know, haven't been able to make it to class the last uh, couple weeks. How are things going for you? Or perhaps um, acknowledging like, wow, what a, what a stressful year it's been. I, it seems like you're under a lot of pressure. Um, how are things going for you? Uh, so to share some kind of observation and usually ask a question um, and then to be there to listen to the student. And so sometimes that means providing a quiet time and space, um, setting up a phone call, um, ensuring that you're kind of distraction free, you're grounded and ready to be there for the student. And sometimes we don't have that luxury and we're just there in, in the moment um, and needing to listen and meet the student where they're at. Uh, so the E in the alert, engage the student. So this is where we want to maybe ask some follow-up questions. Whenever possible, thinking about open-ended questions. Um, we want to try and avoid assumptions. And again, be, be curious and supportive, show compassion. Um, and just a note that this model is not necessarily linear, right? We might start just by listening, and then we do some acknowledging, acknowledging what a lot of stress they're under, what a challenging year it's been. Um, we might ask them some questions about, you know, who they have in their life for support. Um, how have they been getting by? Um, you know, whatever we can do to just help keep the conversation going to give a little bit of space. And sometimes that's all students need is, uh, to have someone to listen to them and to support them, to know that they're heard, they're not alone. And other times they may really need another level of support and that's where the R comes in for referral. And so sometimes, you know, an ideal situation, you may actually be able to book an appointment online with say a counselor or accessibility services with the student and support them to get that next level of um, support in the moment. Other times that might, you know, they might not be quite ready for that and that's okay and you provide them with the contact information um, and how to access support. Maybe just remind them or suggest other resources that are available. Um, and after that point, you know, sometimes you might want to reach out to one of us in student services to maybe debrief a little bit about what your experience was like 
to talk about options, to see if there's anything else that maybe you haven't thought of yet to support the student. So I know sometimes it can be tricky and you don't want to you know, waste anyone's time, um, but it's, it's always okay to just reach out and ask some questions um, and uh, just generally make ensure that you're following the right process because it can feel overwhelming in the moment. And I know we all have a lot on our minds and sometimes we forget you know, what resource might be available and um, how to best support the student. So I see there's been some lots of comments in the chat box, which I haven't fully followed, but it looks like Gemma and Gwen are answering some questions. Um, thank you everyone for your for your thoughts, questions. Yeah. Good. Okay, so we do have uh, a handout and I'm just going to copy and paste that into the chat here. Um, that does have the alert model a little bit more fully explained with some examples and contact information. Um, and that is available on the resources for faculty and staff section of our counseling webpage. Um, there's some other resources there as well, but I've just shared the link to the um, handout at this time. Okay. So we thought it might be helpful to just take a moment and apply that alert model and think about a scenario that I'm sure many of you have encountered. Um, so I'll just read it out loud. The, this is the scenario we're going to talk about. So an email comes through that is marked high priority. When you open it, you see it is written in all caps. Though the email is addressed to you, several people from offices across campus have been copied on the email. The student is accusing you of being cold hearted, uns unsympathetic to their situation and of ruining their academic career. So some pretty strong statements there, obviously a lot of frustration. Um, so we can see, you know, some signs and symptoms that this student is in some distress, writing in all caps, copying a lot of people. Um, that's a common sign to us that there may be um, the student is, is under a lot of stress, not maybe thinking completely rationally, probably quite triggered. Um, and so not a, not a nice email to receive. And I think important to acknowledge that sometimes we need to take some deep breaths and just step back, maybe consult with a colleague before we respond in the moment. And so I know for me, I when I'm feeling a little bit triggered or agitated by a student um, expressing something to me or demanding or requesting something that feels a little unsettling to me, I feel my whole body kind of flush with heat. And so for me, that's a sign, okay, you need to slow things down, don't respond right in this moment, maybe think about it a little bit, chat with someone, and then come back to it, or do a draft, step away and come back to it. Um, so I think an important reminder for all of us to be really aware of when we get that slightly triggered response, maybe when we, like the student, are probably shifting from that prefrontal cortex, cortex to the amygdala fight or flight response, um, and to make sure we, we look after ourselves in those moments before we even begin to do the alert model. So just a reminder again, ground yourself, take some deep breaths. And then we'd love to hear from you, how, how might you approach the situation? How might you approach the student's um, email? How would you acknowledge, listen, and engage? I'll just give you a minute to you know, think about that. Please share in the chat box what you might say. Um, how you might approach it or feel free to jump on the microphone if you'd like. Uh, this is Gwen here. Uh, this brings me back to some emails that I've received about, you know, being cold hearted, um, but recognizing that uh, I need to check my ego at the door and that it's not um, it's not me that they're upset with. It's a situation. Uh, so I need to remove my personal feelings from it and and consider what it is that the student's going through. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicely said, Gwen. Yeah, really good reminder to uh, just 
distance ourselves from it being a personal attack to a, something that's a, a situational frustration. Um, yeah, really good reminder. And I see we've got a few other comments. So Frankie acknowledged the student's frustration. Absolutely. I think that's a really important piece is, you know, I always think I want to get on the same team as the student before we get into much else. So how do I align with them and acknowledging, listening, um, you know, asking some questions and, and Wanda, I think, you know, of course, there's different ways we could approach this, but like you, I would, I think, want to, in an email, acknowledge those frustrations and then offer to connect over the phone to try and talk through next steps, some possible out, good outcome solutions, resources available. Um, I think that that would be really show compassion. Um, that you care, give the student a chance to really share their frustration and to be heard. So April, I say, take the time to breathe and not take the email personally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, get curious. That's a really good word, I think. You know, curious, not furious, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I often remind myself of that. Uh, Kalia, did you want to share something? Yes, actually. I, I think one thing that I always try and think about with anyone that's having like a hard time is like what got them there so by asking questions and by acknowledging it and like what a lot of people have said of being curious is like what is it that they want or that they feel like what need do they feel that is not being answered right now mm -hmm. um and so by like thinking about that myself i can kind of check my ego at the door i can acknowledge it and i can ask some questions to try and find out what is it that they feel like is keeping them from being heard so yeah. I love that that's yeah that's great and to think about yeah what what has got them to this point what else is going on in their life life perhaps that um, has led to this high level of stress often there's a lot of pressure um, students may be feeling and from family or other areas of their life financial um, and and we don't know that until we've given that opportunity to acknowledge, align, listen, ask some questions. Um, so Ken, I see you say, I think faculty can acknowledge and listen, but also mention that, of course, we are not health professionals. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have a phone conversation and then try to find the appropriate person and resource. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important that we're, this alert model is not the, the kind of the end of the conversation, but the beginning to feel heard and um, just to remind the student that we are a supportive, caring uh, institution and then to refer to the next the next level of support. So I think, you know, who might you want to refer the student to uh, in this scenario? Any thoughts? Yeah, Frankie, a reminder that we all have bad days and say sometimes say things we're not proud of. Um, maybe some adjustments that could be made that will take away some pressure. Yeah connect and listen. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rona, I know I think that you you do a wonderful job of ensuring that there's that space and knowing that sometimes they just they just need that space to be heard. That they are likely not feeling heard, they're feeling ignored, um, likely a bit isolated, and that can go a long way. Yeah, and then April referred to the care team. Yeah, absolutely. I think especially if after a conversation you discover that there the student is truly in a high, high level of distress and not just having a bad couple hours and feeling a little overwhelmed. Um, because I think counseling may also be an appropriate referral depending on the level of distress. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, but either one, totally a good option. Uh, sometimes students aren't ready to be referred in the moment, so I think that space to allow them to feel heard, to kind of bring down their um, level of stress a little bit, that can be helpful before making that referral. Um, and it's okay if they're not ready for it in the moment. I think sometimes people get really worried and think, well, they have to meet with the counselor, they have to, but we can't force the student to meet with us. Um, and sometimes it takes a little time and there might be a couple of follow ups. They might, you know, end up finding other resources and be OK on their own. And, and that's OK, too. Uh, um, leaving the door open. Yeah, really important too. like how. So what next? How how do you follow up and asking if it's OK to follow up with the student um, is a great way to end the conversation. 
Um, and Ken says care team first. Every course is embedded into. Oh, that, yeah, we've talked about that before. And in Moodle, having a a list of resources and a reminder of the supports available, uh, so that it's really easy and straightforward. Really good idea. I think we can maybe continue that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for both students and associate faculty um, to really be clear on what supports are available. One more thing that I had thought of in this scenario is that, you know, writing in all caps, some of the frustration, the accusations, of course, some of those, they don't really fit in with our student rights and responsibilities. Um, and that at some point, you know, if that kind of behavior continued, that once we've aligned and provided some support and listened, that there may be a point in time when one of us, perhaps more at the counselor level, wants to also address some of that behavior and, and what the student might learn from that in terms of finding other ways to express themselves that aren't quite so um, focused on accusations. But again, we wouldn't want to do that in the moment when they're feeling quite triggered and under a lot of stress. That wouldn't go well. Um, Gemma or Gwen, did you have anything to add to, to the scenario or the alert model? Yeah, thanks, um, Sarah. I just noticed April's comment there, which was just floating around my brain. So this is great, April. Thank you for bringing this up. Um, just so drawing some awareness to the fact that for some students, the whole idea of going to a counsellor is just not going to fly. It, it, for some, there's so much um, stigma attached to it still in some instances and um, can be seen as a, a weakness. Um, and so, so it is a curiosity and I think sometimes there's a couple of things that we can do is one, instead of um, saying, here's the counsellor, go see the counsellor, um, and you could talk about um, there are people on campus who work with students, who talk to students when they're struggling. Their names are Gemma and Sarah and Francis. And would you like me to, um, you know, introduce you to Gemma and Francis and Sarah? And, and so we can sort of soften that a little bit. Um, and the other thing um, also, depending on the student, we could talk about, um, instead of the counseling, framework, we can talk about the learning strategy piece, which essentially is just another door into getting the same sort of support because we work with the, the um, students from where they're at, where they're, wherever they're coming from. So sometimes that can be an easier way to sort of engage with the students. So, um, but we're really happy as well to, um, if you're not sure how to engage, we're really happy to um, talk with you to figure out how you might structure uh, that, that piece of the conversation. So, yeah. Thanks. Well, thanks for that comment, April, and great response, Gemma. Natasha, did you have something to add? Well, I just thought I would go off of what Gemma was just saying, that I've noticed a lot of students actually pick up counselling when I brought it up from that perspective in saying that they, um, there are approaches that can be taken uh, to provide you with um, steps because I what I noticed with a, a lot of students is saying there's counseling available they kind of do this I don't have time for counseling uh, yeah. and versus there's proactive ways to become feel more in control and they look at it from the academic sense so I just it, I found I do find that really helpful to talk about the strategies that, that you and Gemma will help to implement into their their work and their lives Awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. I, I think it is a really cool and unique part of our services is the focus on um, some of the coaching and learning strategy and, and just how to be a successful student. Um, that's a lot of the work we do is around things like time management and um, learning skills and managing your stress so that you can be really present and leverage your experience at Royal Roads. So I think the more that we spread awareness around that, um, that may also help in um, the referral process. And I see, yeah, good comment that because we're all, it's all together that the learning strategy email still has the word counseling in it. And we have actually just, yeah, just yesterday, we're having some conversations about this and, you know, whether we need to divide services more or, um, you know, change some language around what we do to make it more approachable. So we are really open to suggestions and appreciate your observations around what might be barriers to accessing our support. So thank you. These are really, really great comments. 
And see, Jason asked about recommended language ideas that can help with intercultural referrals. Hmm. I don't, Alejandra, if you have anything to add at this moment, feel free to jump in. And thank you. Um, no, I think that comment came from uh, a great feedback that we received from Frankie, uh, who I believe she's here on the call, and I think was uh, about awareness as well of um, our Indigenous students and just a you know, more traditional way that we are in the Western world and how we deal with talking and listening to others versus other cultures. And she gave us a great resource that I think would be invaluable as well for others to have if Frankie is able to share it. But I don't want to put her on the spot here, but it was a great resource that I really appreciated and valued. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to have that available, but like Alejandra says, no, no pressure, Frankie. Feel free to jump in if you do have anything to add. Um, and if not, that's totally okay. I see you've made some great points in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. We will watch for that in the in the chat, Frankie. Good. Okay. Um, so that. Thank you. I think we you gave us some really great suggestions on how to incorporate more resources, more awareness, um, how to perhaps consider some of the barriers that students are facing. So we really appreciate those comments. Um, sometimes I think we struggle with knowing when to kind of take a next level of action in terms of referral or immediate support and so we just want to remind you to really trust trust your instincts um, so if you're feeling an unusually high level of concern or worry about a student you know for me that's often that feeling that you just kind of can't let go of at the end of the day or you wake up in the night or early in the morning and you, you're thinking about them that's probably a sign that um, it may be time for a next step an introduction a referral um, and again, of course, you know, knowing that you can always consult with us around that as well. Um, do you feel that unreasonable demands are being placed on you on your time by a student? So um, I'm, I'm sure we've all had those experiences where a student is experiencing a great deal of stress, uh, has some certain circumstances or even a, a certain type of personality style that kind of all combines requiring or I guess demanding, requesting a lot of our time. And so if we're feeling that way, you know, likely we may be starting to get a bit frustrated and we're not necessarily providing the best support to that student. So really good time to check in, you know, with a manager, consult with someone in student services and just take a step back to think about, um, you know, what what other options might be available to support the student. Um, have you been trying to help and the situation remains unchanged? So that's another sign to kind of trust that instincts that maybe a next level of support is required. Or has the student raised topics outside of the scope of your role? So I think, you know, coming back to, to Ken's point too, that, you know, of course we want you to create space and listen and hear students, but there's no expectation that you provide mental health, ongoing mental health support, or something, you know, related to an academic component that's beyond your scope of your role. So just a few questions to think about uh, and help us in identifying when we need to take a next level of uh, referral or support for a student. And thanks, Frankie, I see you provided that resource. That's awesome. And, and just a reminder that there are situations that, you know, we don't even really need to think about what we should do. We just need to make an immediate referral um, to usually the care team in this case, um, and sometimes to security. Um, so reference to suicide, reference to sexual assault, harm to others, harm to self, which might include some concerning drug or alcohol use or highly disruptive behavior. So in these situations, absolutely contact care um, and or security, um, in some cases, 911 um, immediately. So those are times that we don't even think about it. We just, we know we need to contact extra support. Immediate referral. Any comments, questions about that? Well, pretty clear. Okay. Um, so I see Jason. 
You're wondering about harm to others related to teamwork interactions, including the AWOL students. Yes. Okay. So um, I would say that's a really good question, Jason. And I think the harm to others, yes, there may be some psychological harm definitely to their well-being, but in those situations, it's not, uh, I think, to the level of needing, you know, calling security. Um, I think definitely, you know, the collaboration between team coaches and counseling might be appropriate in that situation. Uh, care team, if someone's showing signs of distress. But I think in terms of this immediate referral, we're talking about immediate urgent harm. Um, and I know it's a little bit fuzzy. Uh, feel free to jump on the mic, Jason, if you wanted to clarify that further. Um, yeah, I, says, I can. Yeah. Just yeah. a little bit. I mean, I, I, I see the point about the, the immediate referral, like you said, with, with campus security or something like that, as opposed to the, the issue there. Um, well, I guess one of the things I'm one of the things we often see is it's not necessarily a the student itself. It's that the student's actions are causing a high amount of stress for other students, and so then that's sort of where I again as team coaches, right? We we're looking at how they're interacting together. So we often get these these really frustrated students, um, and I'm wondering uh, if we should be trying to put more of our effort on referring the students who are affected um, as what, you know, kind of referring both sides. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Because, hmm. yeah, and I, I like that all three of us answered yes really fast to Jennifer's question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the team coaches are like, yes, definitely increase team conflict this year. Um, yeah, it's absolutely. I think people are feeling really stretched. So I think we've seen that as well from the counseling end. Um, and yeah, I think absolutely the people being impacted by disruptive behavior in a team, I think that makes a lot of sense to be referring to counseling support. And we certainly see students coming to us for that reason very frequently. Um, and I think that that would be more, again, of that, you know, not calling the care number at 10 p.m. at night situation, but uh, during working hours, collaborating, uh, checking in, getting the right supports in place. I think Gwen mentioned kind of trying to get to the core of the problem and help the students get on, get back on track. So um, yeah, definitely some support required and we want to act quickly, but not in an urgent, immediate way necessarily. Does that clarify that a little bit? Yes, thanks, thanks, Dara. Sorry. Sorry. Great. Um, sorry, I'm I'm trying to catch up with the chat box at the same time and realize you guys are all just sitting there waiting while I read. Um, <laughs> so I see. Is it possible for team counseling to work with the team in one session? Um, okay, I'm not quite sure I understand that question, Angelina. Do 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 you know, Gemma? Maybe what? That's getting it. Uh, I'm wondering, Angelina, if you mean team coaching. So the team coaches can certainly work with, um, yes, so the, so the team coaches work with the team as a whole if there's conflict, um, whereas us counsellors work with, with individuals about individually how they might be able to um, uh, continue to show up and be successful um, for this sort of schoolwork writ large. Um, and the team coaches work with the with the teams. So, and they absolutely do that. That's a, I would go out on a limb and say that's a large bulk of their work is actually mm -hmm. helping manage the um, the conflicts. Um, to the point, I think there are two. So I can't remember where it is. April asked if when is care available. So, I think that's a really um, a really good question. And Sarah, sorry, maybe you want to take that one, but I'm just I just dived in there. Sorry. Sure. Oh yeah, I'm happy, happy to. Um, yeah, really good question. And we will show a slide that kind of outlines that a little bit more in a moment. But the care team is, someone is on call all evenings and weekends, and we will share how to contact them for something that is a very urgent need. Um, for the more general, like I'm concerned about this student, I'd like someone to follow up in the next day or so. 
generally that would be more responded to uh, during office hours, Monday to Friday, and you know, in terms of the emails that come through the care inbox. And the phone number is really more for the evening weekend response that are, is very urgent need. Um, so like I say, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a moment, but I hope that helps a little bit, April, to, to distinguish that availability. And Gwen has posted something about it as well. Okay, really, those were really uh, so many great comments and questions. And, um, you know, we will have some more time for, for those types of general and more specific questions. Um, but I think we wanted to just switch gears a little bit and I'll pass things over to Gemma. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, so all through this, we've been talking about students and taking care of students. And we're also at the same time, hopefully just acknowledging that, you know, especially this year more than ever all of us are managing our own self and our own stress um, and then we're asked to, to give a little bit more to someone else and that can really be depleting of our own resources and um, so we want to spend a little bit of time talking about you know, taking care of ourselves or taking care of yourself we see this is not just an addition not just something that uh, is you know sounds nice in theory but uh, but you know who has time for that but really in terms of this is important um, in terms of counselors we're actually expected to pay attention to our self-care we're expected to actually um, take time to debrief with other with a, you know another mentor um, to make sure we're not taking on too much of other people's stuff and so we just really want to um, encourage that for you as well, especially if you've had a really difficult conversation with a student or you've had a difficult email exchange with a conversation, this is a really important step. So we've got the alert model and Sarah and I were kind of joking saying, should we call it the alerts model with the S on the end, but that sounded a bit silly. So here we are with, uh, with this idea of taking care of yourself after um, supporting a student who's in distress. This doesn't need to be big, this doesn't need to be um, you know, expensive or time consuming, but it's really in the details, the small little things that we can do for ourselves. So we just wanted to spend a little bit of time with you, just taking a moment to reflect on what might you do for yourself? What might you, um, what, what's one of the small ways that you could show, show a little bit of kindness, a little bit of care, wrap yourself in you know, kind of a warm blanket of um, care and kindness after you've had a difficult exchange or something? with one of your students. So wonderful, someone suggested go for a walk outside, have a tea, that's one of my favorites. Take a moment to check in with yourself and see how you're feeling. Yeah, great. Taking some deep breaths, feeling really good. Love it, getting, some sleep, getting enough sleep at night. Sometimes it's good just to say, okay, I'm, that's enough for today. It's enough, I'm just gonna, Press the stop button and get a good night's sleep and then wake up the next day and start again. Have a child or pet. Um, talk to a friend. Wonderful. Check in with someone who has the capacity to listen. So they can be a friend, a family member, a mentor, maybe um, the EAP providers. Taking some breaks, definitely. Breaks are really important. Oh gosh, I've got so many wonderful ideas. A bottle of wine, <laughs> maybe just a glass or two. Is it mantras? Great. So many small things we can do. Hug a child or a pet. <laughs> do them qigong. Wow, that's an interesting one too. Oh, go watch birds pecking for food. That's such a lovely idea. I actually was at the beach the other day and saw a, um, a new bird, a bird that was new to me. So it was really fun and just kind of, ah, I could feel my, my shoulders drop. These are wonderful. Good workout outside, expressing gratitude. Oh my gosh. Um, there's so many things that we can do, just these little taking these little tiny moments for ourselves just to take care of ourselves and um, bring us back from the stress and the distress that we might have been experiencing with students. And it's going to be hard to do if we're feeling um, overwhelmed uh, or already stretched, I feel like we don't have any time. 
And um, I guess my encouragement to you, if you're feeling that way, is um, you know you really don't have you don't you don't have the time not to do this, not to take a deep breath, or a few cycles of deep breath, or take a moment to look out your window if you can't go outside. Take a moment to um, you know look at a picture of your pet or your child if you can't manage to get to them to give them an actual hug. Just take a moment for yourself because we all need it. Oh, I love that someone start and underline, state your boundaries, realistically what you can take on. Yes, yeah, so important. And close your door and act like a child for a moment. <laughs> yeah, nature's really meaningful, wonderful. There's lots of lovely little ways. And I think it's, you know, in the busyness of life, it's so easy to forget about these little pieces that are so important. So thank you for sharing that. And um, I guess if I would uh, just have one takeaway for that I would hope that you would take away from today is whatever you have um, contributed to the screen or if there's something there that on the screen that kind of made you smile a little bit, maybe commit to taking just a moment to do that for yourself today at some point. Wonderful. It was always just such a joyful moment for me to see all the different ideas that people come up with and the things that people are doing. So thank you. And it's different for everyone. Lovely. So I'm going to move on and uh, shift us back to our focus on the students. And um, our team um, really just wanted to spend just a moment acknowledging um, COVID and the illness that um, may come to some of our students. And, um, you know, really this is a, um, you know, it's a public health issue, really, if someone is sick with uh, COVID um, virus. But at the same time, we just want to make sure that everybody knows that the way we're responding to this and hoping everybody responds to this is with care and compassion. So if um, you're an instructor and a student comes to you and lets you know that they're really ill right now, um, just really encouraging you to use, um, you know, use your discretion and leave us in compassion to, you know, extend timelines for assignments, et cetera. That doesn't need to come through, um, you know, anyone else except for you. Um, really just, just take that take that on as your own, own thing. Um, and if you do hear of a student who is um, sick with uh, the virus, then the care team would really appreciate knowing. So that can just be a quick email to the care team just to let them know, just so that we can make sure, especially with any of our international students who may not have family or close friends to, to um, check in on them, make sure they're doing okay, make sure they have everything they need. The care team is kind of doing that wraparound service, for instance, that, uh, that might require that. Um, this uh, slide here is, my understanding is it's going to be fairly widely spread um, to students. We just wanted you to know that uh, this is there and it's a lovely little flow chart that is a, you know, kind of follow the steps as, as needed. So in these um, sessions in the past, we've just taken a little bit of time just to address the, um, this idea of confidentiality. So in one of the early slides, many of you had indicated that uh, one of the things that often happens in your different and varied roles throughout the university is students disclose really um, personal information or deep, heavy situations that they're going through. And sometimes for staff and faculty, um, it can be difficult to know which pieces to hold as confidential and which pieces to share. And um, I think what Sarah was, was um, imparting before, there are some situations where really confidentiality goes by the wayside with the idea that we really want to be doing what we can to support students. So things like harm, if they're um, expressing or we're worried about them harming themselves or someone else, or they're having thoughts of suicide, um, or if there's um, potential for sexual violence um, on the campus at any point, then really we need to know that by we, I mean the, the student sort of services team need to know so that we can make sure we're keeping everybody safe. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do. So if you're curious about or uncertain about whether you should hold something confidential or not, then um, that could be a good idea to just reach out to one of us and have the conversa conversation in sort of more broad terms and we can help um, sort of navigate that as well. If something feels really heavy 
then there's a good there's a good chance that maybe it's something that you shouldn't have to carry by yourself. Um, and uh, you know, I know even for us counselors, if uh, someone talks to us about suicide, for example, then we are really clear that we don't have to keep that confidential. We would share that with our managers. We'd share that perhaps with other support people who might be able to help us support the person. So. Um, Confidentiality is a really, really important concept. But as Gwen said there, um, you know, our duty to care trumps it in those situations, but always being mindful of who needs to know this information. We don't share it with everybody. We share it with the people who are in the best situations to, to provide the support and help that we need. Can I just jump in quickly, Gemma? I just wanted to share something that I've observed over uh, several years now is, um, you know, now and then we do kind of a wellness check on a student who may have maybe MIA or has been, you know, displaying some concerning behavior. And I know people are really hesitant sometimes to, you know, to share that information with us um, and worried what the student's going to think when they get this random email from a counselor. Um, and I, you know, there's one time I found a student was a little disgruntled by that, but quickly became appreciative. For the most part, you know, students are like, wow, thank you so much for reaching out. Or, you know, I'm, I'm so impressed at, you know, Royal Road's kind of proactive approach. Um, usually people are quite happy or sometimes we just get ignored and that's okay too um, but I just want to kind of affirm that it's very rare that someone is really upset by that kind of outreach is that you fair from your experience too Gemma yeah I'm nodding furiously here again yes yeah. but <laughs> too um, and I always think too uh, you know my early days of counseling and, and learning from different mentors it's always it, you know I'd rather have someone mad at me than have you know something really terrible happen so um you know and I, in my experience i've never had someone be really mad at me for reaching out saying i've heard that you might be struggling so yeah, yeah, yeah thank you that's a really great point sarah mm -hmm. so what we'll, we'll be waiting for is how how do you go about um accessing the support so you don't have to do all of this care um, and offering all this compassion on, on your own because we know that for all the students we see, we know you're seeing so many more and you're caring day in, day out and supporting day in, day out. So um, we just really want you to know that we're here to, to support you. Um, for the care team, so again, for students who are in crisis or really high levels of distress, so the more urgent needs, um, there is a, you know, um, the team sort of rotates around um, and they're available evenings and weekends sort of a, for an on-call service um, and they can be contacted through uh, security services, um, through uh, the university or if it's not sort of really critical in this moment needing support then an email is generally preferred so care at rollroads.ca. Um, and then for sort of the more general lower, less, low, lower level of distress and stress that students might be um, experiencing um, oh, sorry, I'm going to make a point. So evenings and weekends were really urgent situations. So not just August team is struggling, you know, with an assignment that's due on Monday. It's like we're like really thinking through uh, and protecting the care team as well. What, what their what their what their um, level of uh, <laughs> needing to replenish themselves too is. And then the counselling, uh, the counselling team, so you know, anytime you think that a student might benefit from counselling or from the learning strategy, opening that door up, you can um, encourage them to book an appointment with us, th with us through our online um, uh, calendar, through LibCal, um, or you can email us at counselling at rollroads.ca and you can, um, sometimes that works really well to just kind of do an introductory email for students if they feel, feel if they're okay with that. Um, or you can call us um, and our extension is 4515. We don't answer the phone at the moment, but we do try to call people back within 24 to 48 hours. Um, we are not... Uh, I'm going to say we're not a crisis service. So as I say that, we're not the same as a crisis line, um, like the 24-7 crisis lines that are available, um, including the Here to Help, which is, oh, sorry, Here to Talk, sorry, um, lines that are available for students across Canada right now. We generally are able to see students within seven to 10 days. We usually have some appointments available. Um, we're getting a little more booked up right now, but we do also keep some spots open for 
for truly urgent cases. So if, if you look, help a student look online and there's nothing available sort of in a you know, seven to 10 day week, or if it's something that feels more urgent and critical, please reach out to us and uh, we will really do our best to um, squeeze them in somewhere because we, um, yeah, we don't want to let anyone fall through the cracks just because of scheduling. Um, in addition to one-on-one um, -on -one work that we do with students, we also offer a suite of workshops. At the moment, we're doing our fall um, resilience sessions, and uh, our wonderful practicum student, Francis, is leading a session tomorrow on um, self-care in the heavy, heavily digital world, and uh, that was really re well received last time we um, presented that one, so excited for that at noon tomorrow. Um, but we uh, do these um, sessions throughout the year and we're also available if you have a cohort of students that you'd like to invite us in, um, like, like to invite us in to connect with a, a cohort, with your cohort, we'd be more than happy to do that. We've done that with uh, a few different programs, um, particularly around reading and writing and um, sort of, uh, thriving, um, uh, building resilience and time management. So more than happy to connect with you, just email us if that's of interest to you as well. So I think what we might do now is um, perhaps just stop the recording after saying thank you so much for joining us. Really thrilled and hope that um, hope that there's something helpful for you to take away. And uh, we'll just perhaps open up for some questions and some more um, sort of general conversation. Does that sound okay by you, Sarah? That sounds great. Yeah, I've just stopped. Oh, I thought I.